Hello, welcome back to my channel. This is a problem about flexural stress. Here is the premise. We have a tree. It's the middle of winter and it's been snowing. Snow has been accumulating on this branch and you're worried that due to the weight of the heavy snow that we're gonna get a flexural failure in the tree fibers right here at that failure plane. What you decide to do is before you go outside to knock the snow off of the tree and potentially save the branch from being ruptured, um, you go ahead and set up analysis models. You're inside, you've got your coffee, it's a beautiful winter morning, and um, you decide to model, you kind of eyeball the width of this branch, and so you're like, okay, I'm going to model this as a solid cylinder with 120 millimeter diameter. And you know, choose to use just a prismatic cross section. All that means is that the cylindrical cross section is constant for all of these different cross sectional planes, right? In reality, that cross section is going to vary quite a bit, but um, we'll just kind of simplify this into a model that we can wrap our heads around. All right, what else do we need to know? The length of the branch is about three meters. We estimate the weight of the snow. We model it as a triangular load as shown. We want to know the maximum flexural stress in the tree fibers. And um, if we wanted to make this problem a little more realistic, we would also need to know at what stress the tree fibers would rupture. Um, and then we would compare those two stresses, but we're just gonna solve for the maximum flexural stress in this problem today. All right, our first step, as it so often is, is to draw that free body diagram. So there is a picture of the body or our tree branch modeled as a solid cylinder. On top of that, I want to do a, an equivalent force that I'll call F sub R. It's equal to the area underneath this curve. That area has a base of three meters. It has a height of 200 newtons per meter. And of course, you want to divide that two by two since it is a triangle. As always, spot check your units. The meters go away nicely. And we are going to get an equivalent force, a statically equivalent force of three hundred newtons. And of course that's going to be located one third of the way down the beam, right? So we've got this, oops, that was not what I meant to do. We've got this three meter length here. And we know that this resultant force is going to be the third point of the triangle on the heavy side. So we're going to measure one meter from the left end. Okay, is our body in equilibrium yet? And the answer is no, not yet. Let's go ahead and put it in equilibrium by adding a few things to our picture. We do need a vertical reaction force at the support. It's also equal to 300, in, uh, 300 newtons. And I know that because the sum of forces in the y direction is equal to zero. So it has to balance that one out. Um, next up, I do need a reacting moment at the support. Whenever you have a beam that's supported by a fixed connection, you need to assume that there is a reacting moment. It's usually non-zero. It can be zero, but it's usually non-zero. And to figure out what that moment is, you're going to want to sum moments about that point right there, the centroid of the support. Why are we doing it at that particular point? Well, we're just being a little strategic. If we had made any kind of an error on this vertical force reaction, that would not carry over into our moment calculation. So that's a way to kind of minimize potential errors. Okay, so if I'm uh, summing moments about this point, which I'll just call point A, just doing a moment summation at A, that is equal to zero. And I've got this resultant force, 300 newtons, located at a one meter distance from A. And that causes a clockwise or negative rotation. So put a minus sign there. Um, next term, you need to make an assumption as to the way that that uh, moment is going to go. And the way that I do that, 
is I just kind of freeze frame this and be like, okay, well, if F sub R causes a clockwise rotation, then my reacting moment needs to be equal and opposite that. So this is going to be the reacting moment at A. I'll put a little cross hatch that I use sometimes to distinguish between reactions and applied loads. And now let's put that into our equation down below. Okay, M sub A, that is an unknown. We've made an assumption as to the direction. That one is a counterclockwise or thumbs up if you're using the right hand rule. Either way, you give that a positive sign, set that equal to zero solve this simple equation and state that the moment, the reacting moment at A, at the leftmost plane, the fixed plane is equal to 300 Newtons times meters. Okay, and I'll go ahead and um, let's see, I wish that I had not drawn this. Let me just erase this really quickly. Boop, 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 boop. Erase all of that. Okay, a little messy, but It'll work for us. I'm just going to swap that moment out here for M sub A and just type in 300 Newtons times meters. And now I no longer need this calculation at the bottom, so I'll just get rid of that. Okay. All right, we've got our reactions all figured out. Got our reactions all figured out. Let's take a look back at the landscape of the problem and see what our next step is. So we're asked to find the maximum flexural stress. And we know that our equation, our flexure formula, is normal stress is equal to minus my over i. And there's a couple assumptions that are hardwired or embedded into that equation. The first is that kind of we're looking at an x, y um, coordinate system like this. In other words, the assumptions in this formula are telling us that x is the longitudinal axis. It's telling that the moment is about z. Okay, so Z, of course, is the axis coming out of the page. So I'll kind of draw it there at the origin. The best way to visualize this is to use your right hand. Put your right thumb in the X direction, your right index finger in the Y direction. Your middle finger should kind of come out of the screen toward you. That would be the Z axis direction there. So our moment is going to be about Z and Y is measures the perpendicular distance away from the centroidal z-axis. Okay, so this, this equation has a few assumptions about coordinate systems hardwired into it. Okay, I'll kind of make this small, but I don't want to lose it completely. So I'll just kind of put it there for the time, time being. All right, so if we want to get the maximum stress, so if we want to get the maximum stress, that means we also need to get the maximum bending moment. And we need to get kind of my maximum position y which also goes by a different symbol, a lowercase c. This is not a c for compression, it is just a c for distance. Down here in the, down here in the denominator, we'll, we, we will need to compute a moment of inertia. This one will be about the centroidal z axis. So that's kind of what we need to get, get to to solve this problem. Uh, let's focus on figuring out m max first. And to do that, I got two ways to think through that. I can do this the hard way or the easy way. I'll do it the hard way first, because the reason why I know about the easy way is just because I have experience doing these types of problems. If you're watching this tutorial, you probably don't have that experience. So it's okay to do things the long way until you figure out what the easy way is. The long way will work. 100% of the time, and that is doing the shear and moment diagrams. 
I'm going to put some units over to the left of these plots. So my shear is a force. So I'm going to be using units of newtons for my shear diagram. Moment, of course, force times distance. So I will show this in newtons times meters. And at this point, I just want to do a little graphic integration of my first function, which is essentially uh, this loading diagram with these reactions included. And I want to integrate that to get my shear diagram, integrate a second time to get my moment diagram. All right, I'll do this in a navy blue color. Shear diagram start at zero, increase by 300. That puts you up here. And then I want to decrease over the length by the area under this curve. We calculated that area previously. It's 300 newtons. That makes good sense. 300 minus 300 will get us back to zero. Um, and now we need to figure out what type of function is used uh, for our shear diagram. And the way we do that is we go up here to our loading diagram. This one is linear. So if I integrate a linear function, I know I'm going to have a quadratic function. And then the hard part here is figuring out which one it's going to be. So is it going to be the concave down quadra quadratic function or the concave up quadratic function? A couple ways to think through this in terms of the calculus, but I think the easiest way to do it is to look at this value. That value of load is zero. And so all I need to do is figure out which of these curves has a slope of zero. And so by using that process, I can determine that this shear diagram is the correct one. All right, so I've got this quadratic shear diagram. Now I've got the area under the curve. I can use my shortcut formula here. It's a good one to know. So this area. So the area underneath a quadratic or x squared function is going to be two thirds or one thirds of the bounding box. That orange rectangle is my bounding box. And then I have the smaller of the two pieces, right? So this quadratic curve makes a small piece here and a big piece here. I have the smaller piece. So I'm going to use one third of the bounding box. That's a base of three meters and a height of 300 newtons. We get 300 newtons times meters for that area. Now we're ready to do our moment diagram. We start at zero. The first thing we see is this support right here. We see that we have a reacting moment of 300 newtons times meters. This one is counterclockwise. It's the beginning of a negative moment. So we jump down. We jump down here. So 300 newtons times meters. I've talked more about shear and diagrams in other videos, so I won't over explain that here. But if you're confused about that, why that's down and not up, that's a common misunderstanding. So go back and check out one of the earlier shear and moment diagrams to think through that and learn that material. Um, next up, we just want to increase by the area under the shear curve. That's 300. So I'm at minus 300, increase by 300. That gets me to zero. Now, how do I get there? Well, if I integrate a quadratic function, that means I'm going up one order of x. That's a cubic function or x cubed. Last piece, which cubic function is it? Is it this one or is it that one? Is it the concave up or the concave down? Let's use the same trick with the, with the values and slope relationship. So since my shear value is zero, my moment slope is zero. Which of those curves meets those constraints? Well, the only one that works is concave down like this. Okay, so we did a lot of work to do our shear and moment diagrams to then conclude that the maximum bending moment, the one that I want to plug into this equation right here, we did a lot of work to flush this out and be like, hey, that reacting moment at the support is our worst case moment. With experience, you'll be able to 
recognize that just from this diagram or even from this one. But until you pick up on the patterns, go ahead and take the trouble to do the shear and moment diagrams. That practice is good for you regardless. All right, so let's start plugging things in over here. Sigma max is equal to, and first minus sign is hardwired into the equation. My bending moment, I'll go ahead and stick with signs here, and then I'll explain why I typically wouldn't do that. But for now, I'll stick with the signs. So I've got a negative internal bending moment at this plane right here, right at the failure plane where that tree, <clears throat> the tree branch is at uh, jeopardy of rupturing those living tree fibers. And thinking ahead, I do want to mess with the units here. Okay, so I've got newtons times meters, but I'm computing a stress. Stresses are usually in megapascals, that's newtons per millimeter squared. So because of that, I'm going to change this 300 newtons times meters into 300 E3 newtons times millimeters. So I'm swapping out my meter for a thousand millimeters just to set myself up for success with respect to my units. The rest of this is kind of a cross-sectional analysis. So we need a distance y to go in here and then we'll put the moment of inertia down here. And I'll zoom in. We don't need these shear and moment diagrams anymore pick out a nice fine black pencil and let's do a cross-sectional view. So we decided to model this tree as a cylinder, something like that. Okay, so we know by inspection that the centroid is equal to half of the height. In the problem statement, it says that we're modeling the solid cylinder as a diameter of 120 millimeters. So we've got a 120 millimeter diameter. Um, that means that my radius is half of that. That's 60 millimeters. And let's think about our coordinates up above. So this is a cross-sectional view. Now x, the longitudinal axis, is the one coming out of the screen. And so we're going to put y going straight up. Oh, and I don't want to make an error with the right hand rule. So let me think about how I want to explain this. Um, I don't want to over explain and cause more trouble than it's worth. Let's just do this kind of a simple, a simple way. And what I'm going to do is just call this axis without an arrow the z centroidal axis. And then I don't have to worry about whether z is pointing to the left or the right. And that's going to tell me whether x is coming into the page and out of the page. But that starts to overly complex something that's really not that complicated. So I'm going to um, not explain that in any more detail right now. All right, so we have our centroidal axis z going here. Our y is measuring position. And we want to kind of plug in that maximum value. What is the maximum value you can travel perpendicular away from the centroidal z axis? And that's going to be 60 millimeters. So in that little calculation, you know, you're starting at the centroid and you're like, okay, I can go a maximum distance of 60 meters down or a maximum distance of 60 meters up. Either way, we can plug 60. I think I said meters, I meant millimeters, 60 millimeters of distance. And this is kind of a plus or minus thing, right? Because I could go upward or downward to get to those extreme fibers. And what, all we need is a maximum. We're not asked about tension versus compression. We're just asked to find a maximum. So even though I'm following the signs through, the signs aren't really critical in this particular problem. In the denominator, I need the moment of inertia. And this is a good one to memorize. The moment of inertia for a solid circular cross section is pi over 4 radius to the fourth. Okay, don't get that mixed up with another 
moment of inertia. This one is a polar moment of inertia that looks really similar, except for that number and the denominator is different. So don't get that mixed up. The one that we want is the moment of inertia about that centroidal axis. You're welcome to derive that one on your own if you'd like to see where it came from, but it's just a handy one to memorize and to use. Let's put that in the denominator, pi over 4, 60 millimeters to the fourth power. All right, we're looking pretty good. We're looking pretty good. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel these two out. I've got two minus signs. Those can go away. In the denominator, I have millimeters to the fourth. And in the numerator, I have millimeters squared. So I'm just going to change this to millimeters squared. That gives me a Newton per millimeter squared. And that's my good old megapascal. So at this point, it is calculator time. At this point, it is calculator time. Let's punch in 300 E3 times 60 divided by pi times 4 divided by 60 to the fourth. And you should get 1.76 megapascal. OK, so we're asked to find the maximum flexural stress. So it would be OK to leave your answer you know, in this very simple format. That's definitely a magnitude of a maximum. But if you wanted to be more specific, you could think about that free body. And you could think about, OK, I've got a I've got a fixed end here. I have the cylinder. I've got my snow load that goes like this. Okay. My deflected shape or deformed geometry, I'm going to get the sag of the tree branch under the load. And once I kind of visualize that internal negative bending moment, that's where I can see I've got tension in the top fibers and compression at the bottom. So if I wanted to be more specific about this answer, I could say something like my maximum tensile stress is 1.76 megapascal at, and I'll just make this easy and say the top fiber, if you were wanted to express that mathematically, you would say at y is equal to positive 60 millimeters. So this top fiber right there is going to get that maximum um, tensile stress. And you could also say, and my maximum compressive stress is equal to 1.76 megapascals at the bottom fiber. And in mathematical terms, you just say at my <laughs> at y is equal to minus 60 millimeters. Um, and this negative bending, right, if you sketch the deformed shape, you can visualize it that way, but it's also what your moment diagram has told you conclusively over here, right? So if your moment diagram is negative, that means you've got negative bending moment all the way across. And whenever you have an internal negative bending moment, you have tension on top, compression on the bottom, and then that neutral axis where stress is equal to zero, that flies all the way through the centroid of the member, just as shown there. Greatly exaggerated, of course. I think that concludes this problem. So we were able to calculate from the comfort of our house that um, that tree branch is experiencing roughly 1.76 megapascals and you could compare that to known values of wind tree living tree fibers for a particular species rupture and determine whether it's worth your time to go outside and knock the knock the snow off the branch so hope you enjoyed this video thank you for tuning in